Today's video is sponsored by Hunter Killer. Well my friends, the scent of pumpkin spice lattes is in the air again, and that can only mean one thing. It's Halloween season. Being a fan of all things spooky, it's of course my favourite time of the year, and I like to indulge in as many creepy activities as I can before the festivities come to an end. If you're looking for something more interactive and social than just watching another horror movie, you should try Hunter Killer, the ultimate murder mystery subscription box for fans of true crime. Unlike watching a thriller unfold on TV, Hunter Killer makes you a part of the action, placing you in the shoes of a detective and tasking you with catching an elusive murderer. Whether it's date night or game night, Hunter Killer brings people together by challenging them to decode ciphers, examine clues, and solve puzzles. It's like an escape room delivered right to your door. My wife and I have been playing through their new box sets recently, and they've really helped us get into that Halloween spirit. If cracking open a cold case with the boys sounds like a fun October activity to you, head over to hunterkiller.com forward slash lazymasquerade and use promo code LAZY to get $10 off your purchase. Again, take advantage of that $10 discount by going to hunterkiller.com forward slash lazymasquerade and using promo code LAZY, L-A-Z-Y, and find out if you have what it takes to solve the mystery inside. At around midnight, on the evening of the 21st of August, 1968, 29-year-old masonry worker Antonio Lobianco and 32-year-old Barbara Locci were driving through a small town about seven miles west of Florence, Italy. Asleep in the back seat was Barbara's six-year-old son, Natalino. But when a sharp jolt suddenly woke the boy up, he opened his eyes to a truly horrifying sight. The car he had been sleeping in had crashed, and behind a cracked and splintered windshield, Antonio and his mother, Barbara, lay slumped in their seats, both of them riddled with bullets that leaked fresh blood onto the upholstery. Natalino then descended into a state of shock, because, the way he describes it, he just ran, instinctually fleeing the scene to escape the mind-shattering trauma. Next thing he knew, it was almost 2am, and he was two kilometres away, knocking at the home of a complete stranger. This stranger said that he was awoken by the sound of a small boy crying. Open the door and let me in. I'm sleepy and my daddy is sick in bed. Then you have to drive me home because my mother and my uncle are dead in their car. You see, Antonio Lobianco, the man who had been driving the car, wasn't Natalino's father. He was a paramour of his mother, Barbara, one of her many boyfriends. Barbara was a married woman but was well known for having multiple love affairs throughout her marriage. Her husband, and Natalino's biological father, was a man named Stefano Mele. Naturally, Italian homicide detectives suspected Stefano of being the murderer, with jealousy being his motive, but a lack of evidence forced them to turn to some less than savoury means to obtain a conviction. When Natalino knocked on the stranger's door, he said that his father was sick in bed on the night of the murder but now he was saying that his father was present at the scene. Now it's entirely possible that Natalino changed this story on his own, but it's believed that the police coached him into saying this. Stefano himself had a hard time proving this wasn't true, and a regional prosecutor made such a strong case to a scandal-hungry jury that, in the end, Stefano was declared guilty and sentenced to 18 years in prison. It appeared to be an open and shut case, a classic example of a jealous lover's crime of passion. But six years into Stefano's sentence, the murder of another couple would exonerate him entirely. On the night of September 15th, 1974, 19-year-old bartender Pasquale Gentilcore had driven out to a quiet country lane near the small town of Borgo San Lorenzo, about 12 miles northeast of Florence. He was accompanied by his 18-year-old accountant girlfriend, Stefania Patini. By all accounts, the two of them were very much in love and often visited a popular discotheque known as Teen Club. Friends later said that they were usually jolly and carefree, but on the night of September 15th, the couple appeared to be extremely tense. When they were asked what was bothering them, Stefania told her friend that a few days prior, a strange man had followed her during a driving lesson. She had forgotten about it soon after, but had spotted that same man earlier that evening, almost as if he was stalking her. When asked what the man looked like, Stefania could only give a vague description, but added that there was something about this man that she found terrifying. 
The couple departed the teen club earlier than usual, before driving out to a quiet country lane. This particular roadway wasn't exactly uninhabited, as it was a stretch of road that was known by the locals as something of a lover's lane. A place where young couples could escape to, in order to get some privacy and intimacy. Upon their arrival, Stefania and Pasquale found there were a handful of other cars lining the lane. Some of these other couples would later report that some strange men had visited the area on foot, but whether or not they were responsible for what followed is pure speculation. The fact of the matter is that the following morning, Stefania and Pasquale were found shot to death in their car. But it was the condition of Stefania's corpse that people found truly horrifying. After being shot, Stefania had been dragged from the vehicle before being mutilated with almost a hundred separate stab wounds. Her killer seemed to have become lost in a frenzy, plunging the blade into her face, neck and chest over and over again before disemboweling her entirely. Once she had been mutilated beyond recognition, Stefania's killer violated her with a grapevine stalk, then left her body on display to be stumbled upon by some unfortunate member of the public, forever condemned to be haunted by that harrowing sight. The police quickly discovered that the gun used to execute both Stefania and Pasquale shared the exact same ballistic patterns as the one used to kill Antonio Lobianco and Barbara Locci, thus exonerating Stefano Mele. But one man's answered prayer became another man's problem, and to the Italian police, the prospect of a serial killer was most definitely not a welcome one. The killer had proven that he was brutally effective, but he also demonstrated a terrifying level of patience and discipline. It would be almost seven years before he struck again, this time on June 6, 1981. 30-year-old warehouse worker Giovanni Foggi and his 21-year-old fiancée Carmela Danuccio would fall victim to the man who came to be known as Il Monstro di Firenze, the monster of Florence. Much like their other murders, the killer targeted his victims late at night while they were alone in their car. He ambushed them with shots from his signature 22 pistol. Then, just as he had done with the previous female victim, he pulled her from the car and began to mutilate her. Only this time, the monster of Florence began to experiment with a kind of calling card, a sign-off, just to let the police know they had a serial killer on their hands. He took out a notched knife, pulled up Carmela de Nuccio's skirt, then cut out her pelvic region entirely before carrying it away as a terrifying trophy. The following morning, a man named Enzo Spalletti apparently started talking about the murders before the bodies had officially been discovered. And this was all it took for the Italian police to seek their second false conviction, with Enzo being jailed for three months before finally being cleared of suspicion. The monster of Florence had waited almost seven long years to kill again, but it appears his bloodlust was only growing with age. Because, unlike his previous murders, which all seemed to fully sate whatever deprived desire drove him to kill, the murders of Giovanni Foggi and Carmela de Nuccio didn't seem to quench his thirst for gore, and it took just a matter of months before he once again went on the hunt. 26-year-old labourer Stefano Boldi and his fiancée Susanna Cambi were due to be married in November of 1981. They never got the chance to exchange their vows though, as in October they were both shot and stabbed in the small Tuscan town of Calenzano. Much like before, Camby's pelvic region had been severely mutilated, and the killer had evidently taken a large section of flesh as a trophy. The killer's next attack in June of 1982 perhaps makes him more befitting of the name, the Tuscan Ripper, and so just like his Victorian forebearer, he was suddenly interrupted during one of his crimes and, as a result, was robbed of his chance at carving out another trophy. Paolo Mainardi and Antonella Migliorini were so inseparable that they were nicknamed Vinaville by their friends after an Italian brand of superglue. That moniker proved to be entirely prophetic, as they spent their final moments on this earth together, executed by shots from that same 22 while cuddling up in their car. But because the couple were parked up on a relatively busy stretch of road, the killer was interrupted by a good Samaritan who stopped to see if the vehicle's owner needed some help. This prompted the killer to immediately flee the scene. Despite paramedics finding Paolo Maianardi alive at the scene, he sadly passed away while receiving treatment at a Florence hospital. The morning after the murder, 
an anonymous person phoned Susanna Camby's mother and asked to talk to her about her daughter. Obviously, the slaying of another couple was a harrowing and heartbreaking affair, but the mistake showed that the killer was getting sloppy, growing impatient. It seemed like only a matter of time before he made a mistake that would be his last. The monster of Florence would go on to murder two vacationing German artists, Wilhelm Friedrich Horst Meyer and Jens Uwe Rusch, as well as a young couple, Claudio Stefanacci and Pia Gilda Rotini. Rotini had been followed by a strange man hours before she was killed. When investigators arrived, they found her pelvic region, as well as her left breast, had been removed. The killer's final victims would prove to be a couple out camping in the woods, Jean-Michael Cravicilli and Nadine Moriart. Their bodies took so long to find that the killer sent a taunting note, along with a piece of his victim's flesh, to the state prosecutor, Silvia Della Monica, stating that a murder had taken place and challenging local authorities to find their bodies. But it seems this cry for attention was a bridge too far for the killer, who realized he was playing a dangerous game with the police and the media. The killing of the camping couple in September of 1985 would prove to be his final act of bloodshed, and for almost a decade, the case of the Monster of Florence remained cold. With the advent of more advanced computer technology, as well as hundreds of tips from the general public, a man named Pietro Pacciani was put on trial for the murders in 1994. Pacciani had previously been convicted of both the carnal assault and murder of his two daughters, as well as for the 1951 murder of a man who had been cavorting with a former lover. After searching his home, police discovered an unfired 22 bullet in his back garden. It was the exact same variety used in the monster murders. Pacciani was found guilty following his trial, but was released from prison two years later following an appeal which cited poor police work as well as a lack of solid physical evidence. Two more men, Mario Vanni and Giancarlo Lotti, were eventually convicted of the murders, and although they remain in prison to this day, their sentences have been widely criticised, and it's commonly believed that both men have been scapegoated for an unsolved crime. Years later, in 2001, the chief prosecutor on the case claimed that the murders were the work of a satanic cult who were allegedly operating in the greater area of Tuscany during the 70s and 80s. According to him, the victim's body parts were being used in an unholy blood ritual. This prosecutor had apparently discovered a villa in the area where Pacciani had been employed. The very same villa was home to a large, pyramidal stone, one that according to him was highly indicative of high-level cult activity. However, many have dismissed these claims as frankly laughable, and insist the stone has no significance whatsoever. We've previously touched on how the monster of Florence might be more suited to the name of the Tuscan Ripper, but perhaps another nickname is better suited. The Zodiac Killer. There are those who purport that the monster of Florence and California's unmasked Zodiac Killer are in fact the very same person. Okay, so I know I'm releasing this video at a bit of a strange time, so hear me out. Just a few days ago, a group of cold case investigators, known as the Case Breakers, announced that they had identified the Zodiac Killer based on several pieces of compelling physical and forensic evidence. The Zodiac, they claim, was a man named Gary Francis Post. And this had a lot of people convinced that the Zodiac had finally been unmasked, especially since one of the Zodiac ciphers was recently decrypted. However, both the FBI and officials in California have shot down this claim and said that Gary Francis Post isn't a suspect in the Zodiac case. According to local authorities in San Francisco, the casebreaker's evidence is circumstantial at best, and the case officially remains unsolved. So, with that in mind, what's this alleged connection between the Zodiac and the Monster of Florence? Well, in 2018, a trio of Italian news publications introduced the public to a man named Joe Bevelacqua. Born in the state of New Jersey on December 20th of 1935, Bevelacqua spent 20 years in the US Army before moving to Florence in 1974. It was there that he gained work at the Florence American Cemetery, a fitting form of employment for someone who allegedly already dealt with so much death. The theory's main proponent, Francesco Amicone, claimed that Bevelacqua had made a partial confession to him in September of 1997. He then corroborated the details of this confession, 
and found that the Zodiac murders had ceased almost at the exact same time as the monsters began, and matched a proposed timeline of Bellavacqua leaving the US and emigrating to Italy. Bellavacqua was incensed by such an accusation, and publicly threatened to sue Francesco Amicone if he didn't retract the allegations. Yet, unbelievably, Amicone refused to back down, and seemed to challenge Bellavacqua on a number of supposed coincidences. The main being that Bellavacqua would have been an undercover CID agent assigned to an investigation in San Francisco at the time of the Zodiac murders in the late 60s and early 70s. Amicone also alleged that Bellavacqua would have had access to the case files of a double murder which occurred near Florence in 1968, where bullets and shell casings had been improperly stored. He went on to claim that Bellavacqua replaced the pieces of evidence with spent cartridges shot by the gun he would use in the monster's homicides, thus connecting his future crimes to those murders for which he already had an alibi. The accusations were so thoroughly well presented that Italian authorities actually approached Bellavacqua in late 2020, requesting he provide a DNA sample in order to clear his name. The results of any DNA tests haven't been revealed to the public, and that's if any test has taken place at all. But it seems a chillingly strong argument can be made to support the idea that the Zodiac murders lasted far longer and were more far-reaching than anyone could have anticipated. To this day, even though two men sit in prison, many believe the monster of Florence has never been caught. It's entirely possible that the murders could simply be down to a sadistic Italian serial killer, one who quit while they were ahead, having no wider connection to other killers, let alone an underground network of devil worshippers. But, at the same time, we can't rule out the possibility that Il Mostro di Firenze and the Zodiac Killer were one and the same, and that a man was able to brutally murder and mutilate young couples across two different continents with complete and utter impunity. Scary to think about. Well, happy October everyone. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive. We have a lot more videos coming this October, so get ready for those. A big shout out to Sam Riding for writing the script for this one. Just before we end the video, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. Thomas the Handsome, Alex Greensall, Azriel Warakai, Charlie Lackey, Connor Lothan, Crawford K. McDonald, Event Horizon Records, Gina Valera, Grace Archie, Infamous Sempapi, Leonardo Martinez, Mackenzie Griffin, Maria Mendez, Myra Lancaster, Monica Mendoza, Natalie Escobedo, Palmira, Peter Lolgerich, Philip Westra, Procupidine Natter, Ronnie Franklin, Scylla Skeist, Sloan Crawford, Taylor and Monica Gruenk, The Only Dorita, Zane, Ms. Crypto, Damian Bennett, Hungry and Hammered, The Deck of Cards, TNS Mum, Hamish K, The Nuon Goem 24, Bomu 38, and Lydia Glassley. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. It really helps the channel out. Well, that wraps things up for this one, guys. Be sure to smash that like button or I'll smash you. Make sure you're subscribed and the bell icon's clicked, and you'll be hearing from me again very soon. Until then, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.